Hello students, welcome back to the course on Organizational Behavior, Individual Dynamics in Organization. We move to the fourth lecture of uh, the module 9 where we look into learning. In the previous lectures, we have looked into learning specifically with respect to some of the theories associated with that. We looked into classical conditioning, we looked into operant conditioning. But man is always a social animal. So we look into the social learning today specifically. I am Dr. Abraham Sirlaisak, I am an assistant professor at the School of Business, Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. So today's theme for the lecture is, it is difficult to document or explain in a conversation all the steps necessary to bake professional quality bread. So this gives an insight into some element of knowledge which is always tacit. Tacit knowledge is what is vital and critical when it comes to an organization and it's always a pain point when we, when we look into that, how to retrieve that, how to understand that or how to essentially codify that. So on basis of that, we'll start with today's lecture where we look into social learning and specifically social cognitive theory. Now social learning, as I've already mentioned, that man is a social animal. Uh, there might be some restrictions or some, some conditions specifically when we look into, uh, let's say, uh, classical conditioning or operant conditioning where we are guided by certain stimuli or we respond to a certain stimuli. There might be situations where uh, we are actually uh, responding to a certain reinforcement. It could be based on a punishment or it could be a reinforcement in a positive manner. That said, we have to uh, understand the human element. We cannot undermine the presence of human mind. So this brings us to social cognitive theory. Social learning theory specifically states that learning occurs by observing others and then modeling the behaviors, those behaviors which have been observed that lead to favorable outcomes and avoiding behaviors that lead to punishing consequences. Now this is common sense. We look into a particular individual, we observe him within our organization, we see that, let's understand this from an example, we see that an individual is getting awarded or recognized for a certain level of work he or she has done. So we tend to model that individual, we tend to follow that particular individual and we tend to remodel and basically we tend to recreate the whole performance of that particular individual. Now that is a positive case. We have also seen instances when let's say one of our teammates within the organization has been reprimanded by the boss or maybe an higher authority for something that he or she has done. So possibility is that we tend to stay away from that task or that activity. So this is basically in nutshell what you mean by social learning theory. Sort of an observation learning and we should be thankful to Albert Bandura for this uh, bringing in the social element into the learning. So when you are looking into learning of this form, it essentially occurs in three ways. One, behavior modeling. Second, learning behavior consequences. And third is self-reinforcement. Specifically, when we look into behavior modeling specifically, people learn by observing others' behavior, no doubt about it, as I've already established this in the previous example. It could be a role model who has done or who is doing a critical task, remembering the important elements associated with observed behaviors and then practicing those behaviors. So let's say when we were observing that particular individual, we found out that the document management system of that particular individual was very immaculate or um, so efficient. So we tend to actually absorb that particular quality. Or maybe we observe that an individual is able to achieve greater highs within the organization because of behavioral pattern to his subordinates, uh, to the people who does not actually or cannot influence on any of his decision, but still is very, very courteous and when it comes to any, any level of support within the organization, he is getting in that in plenty because of his behavioral tendency or behavior specific to the people uh, who are below his scatter in the organization. That could be one thing. So there are some aspects when we look into a one particular individual, we tend to actually imbibe or we generally tend to learn from him or her. So this is behavior modeling. 
And it comes to learning behavior consequences, as I've already mentioned, we'll see into, we focus into the consequence part. People learn the consequences of behavior through logic and observation, not just through direct experience. When a person is being reprimanded, when a person is being rebuked or he is being shouted upon, we see or we tend to connect it with a certain logic. Why this behavioral pattern or why this exchange of interaction has happened? Is it some flow of him or if it's, is it some, you know, temperamental issues of the senior of, or the boss? So all these aspects have to be logically connected and that logical connect will guide us towards that learning. So social learning is not just direct experience. Let's say I am putting two individuals, I am putting John and Smith in the same organization, same team, they same work and within the team, John sees that Smith is being reprimanded by his boss. Now, because he was in direct contact or he was in direct experience or he has experienced it directly, does not pertain to a learning experience. Rather, most importantly here, John will try to connect it with the links that he has obtained. He'll try to connect the dots. Why, let's say, the boss, let's say, Mr. Peterson has reprimanded Smith. So, all these aspects have to be logically seen or logically understood. And that is where, that is when learning specifically happens. So, it does not mean that I come into a vicinity of a particular individual and learning happens there. It does not happen like that. Rather, more than that, it is the influence or it is the logical and the observational power of that particular individual that leads to the learning. Another important aspect when it comes to social learning is self-reinforcement. Self-reinforcement occurs whenever an employee has control over a particular reinforcer but does not take it actually without completing the set goals. So let's understand this with an, with an example. Say you are students and let's say you want to complete an assignment and you have set a goal for yourself that I will not get up from my study table unless and until I complete the assignment. And once I get it done, the, the assignment part, I can actually raid the refrigerator or I can have a cookie or I can have a piece of cake or something like that. So there is some reinforcer or some reinforcement specifically that you have identified, but you are going to take only that when you have a, a certain level of task accomplishment that is coming to you. This is specifically self-reinforcement. So you have three aspects when it comes to social learning. That's behavioral modeling, learning behavior consequences, and self-reinforcement. So when you are looking into social learning specifically, the theoretical approach to learning was the first to combine and integrate both behaviorist as well as cognitive concepts. If you recall the previous lecture, I was uh, very much vociferous, articulative about uh, the, the behaviorist approach. External elements actually trigger the behavior. But when it comes to the second part of theoretical understanding in learning, we should understand that cognitive concepts, they are also relevant and it emphasizes the interactive, reciprocal nature of cognitive, behavioral and environmental determinants. So it's not just environmental determinants, it is more of the cognitive element that is coming into picture when it comes to social learning. So this is something which I, I mentioned in my previous lecture that it is not correct to say that your behavior, my behavior is actually only guided by external stimuli. There might be some situations where I am looking into a particular person. More than looking, I am observing into a particular observing a particular person. More than observing, I am actually logically trying to connect his behavior or his uh, behavioral, uh, you know, uh, tendencies with some outcome and based on that, some learning is happening. Ladies and gentlemen, that's social learning. Now, when we look into social learning, we should also appreciate social cognition. Now, social cognition, the theory has emerged 
in recent years to go beyond the social learning theory. Social cognitive theory extends learning and are modifying behavior by giving more attention to self-regulatory mechanisms. Now, let's look into the different factors associated with social cognitive theory. It identifies five capabilities specifically that people use to initiate, regulate and sustain their behavior. So, this is a, a pure form of behavior entirety or how the behavior is being uh, presented or displayed in front of you, how it is initiated, how it is regulated and finally how the behavior is sustained. So, the different elements or different capabilities are one is symbolizing, you tend to uh, symbolize with respect to some individual, some behavioral representations, there is a forethought given, vicarious modeling. Vicarious modeling is when you are actually trying to model a particular person, usually somebody who is more related to you. In one of the lectures in this course, I will try to elaborate on this. But at this point, vicarious modeling for you will be something where I can actually try to model somebody. Now, in vicarious modeling, you have to understand that if I want to actually, let's say, be a better cricketer, I can see and observe, let's say, Virat Kohli, I can see and observe Sachin Tendulkar or Brian Lara or any greats of the game within the uh, television parameters and I can see, observe how they make each shot, I can uh, understand how the ballers are balling, all these aspects could be modeled. But there is a constraint there with respect to the relatedness. So, the level of talent, I have an in, inherent understanding that a level of talent I am possessing, whatever good cricketer I may be, I might not match Virat Kohli, I might not match uh, Sachin Tendulkar for that matter. Rather, if I am trying to observe my friend, let's say Ketan, he is playing a shot with such a finesse, such a ease, then I would try to observe that and understand the very fact that if he can play that, I can also do that. So, this is specifically vicarious modeling where you tend to relate the learning or the modeling part with somebody who is close to you rather than very big figure or rather than a celebrity in that case. So, another important point when it comes to social cognitive theory is self-regulation and finally self-reflection. There cannot be any learning that can happen without self-regulation. The control in learning is essentially made by self-regulation and when you are actually made or monitored your behavior, you tend to reflect on that and that's where self-learning or self-reflection happens and learning happens through self-reflection. Now, when you look into the different principles of learning specifically, reinforcement and punishment, these are two important keywords, reinforcement and punishment play a vital role in the learning process and they provide evidence-based principle for behavioral performance management. Now, most learning experts generally agree that a reinforcement is more critical than punishment and is the single most important concept and application principle. So, when you are looking into any aspects of theory or any theoretical understanding in learning, any principles of learning, you have to understand this basic philosophy that most of them agree with one fact that reinforcement is better than punishment. There are some organizational systems, please take a moment and reflect on your organization, whether your organization categorically depends on or categorically focuses on punishment or is your organization more focused on reinforcement, giving some level of recognition, giving some level of appreciation that would add to reinforcement. Rather, are you always reprimanded? Are you always scolded, shouted at, ridiculed? then you are in a system which is triggered by more of a punishment based mechanism. So, the first theoretical treatment given to reinforcement in learning and the framework that still dominates today is the work of the pioneering psychologist Edward Thorndike's classic law of effect. Let's look into law of effect. Behaviors specifically that are followed by favorable 
or satisfying consequences become more likely to be repeated in the future, while behaviors that are followed by unfavorable or unsatisfying consequences become less likely to be repeated. Now, when we hear this, it seems or it sounds a bit complex, but trust me, it's very simple. When you are looking into a behavioral pattern, let's say there's a favorable outcome or a consequence, then we are more likely to adapt that behavior. When we are observing a behavior and we see that the consequence related to or associated to that behavior is essentially negative, we tend to stay away from that behavior. This is common knowledge and this is what is called as a law of effect. From a strictly empirical point of view, most behavioral scientists, specifically even those with a very strict cognitive orientation, generally accept the validity of this law. If you basically understand the, the weightage of this particular statement, you will tend to appreciate that when you are looking into conditioning, when you are looking into be it classical or operant, you are actually stating that there is some relevance of uh, behavior that is guided by punishment, that is guided by some results associated with either your punishment or with respect to your reinforcement. But when it comes to cognitive element, essentially the, the principle or the theoretical hook lies around the very fact that your mind is under application and you are guided by your mind. But even most of the cognitive theorists who are related to learning or they work in the platform or in the, in the sphere of learning, they even acknowledge the fact that reinforcement and punishment like that is what is said in law of effect has a certain effect or has a certain impact in the learning, no doubt about it. So let's look into some of the key points of the theory. The first and the important aspect would be consequences shape behavior. We don't need any great explanation in actually understanding this. We generally stay away from road rage because we, we feel or we see that the road rage consequently leads to a, a particular uh, criminal charge or maybe particular uh, penalty against you. We generally follow traffic rules because we see that if we don't follow, there is a negative consequence associated with that. So this is the learning. Now let's come into organization. We generally tend to finish a work within the deadline for the simple reason that either there are chances that you may be ridiculed, you may be shouted upon, or there are chances that your performance is evaluated in a negative way and possibly you are not going to make the cut when it comes to the next promotion. So all these aspects hover around the very fact that consequences shape behavior. You can relate it with n number of examples within your organization. Think for 10 seconds and think of those situations where you have learned and understood that consequences essentially shape behavior. Now let's look into the second aspect which is reinforcement and punishment. Reinforcement and punishment will come into greater detail in reinforcement and punishment specifically. Reinforcement and punishment play a central role in the learning process and provide essentially evidence-based principles for behavioral performance management. So even which was developed by Skinner, reinforcement theory suggests that behavior can be modified through the use of reinforcements which can be either positive or negative. So there are certain different positive or negative reinforcement that happens, positive reinforcement happens, negative reinforcement happens, punishment happens and even extinction happens. Before going into the, the reinforcement and punishment because that would be the, the core discussion with respect to this lecture, we also look into other aspects like learning through consequences. So we will we'll visit back reinforcement and punishment in a short while. Learning through consequences, it is nothing but an extension of consequences shape behavior. Once the consequences shape behavior, you tend to behave in a certain way. I don't see that tomorrow there is a chance that you are going to repeat the same behavior. So learning happens through these consequences. Another important aspect is context dependent. 
when you are looking into context dependent i have i have categorically mentioned in the beginning of the lecture in the beginning of the course and even in the introduction video that we take the context as one of the most important aspects so many a time if we generally look into these aspects of consequences shaping behavior or learning through consequences we should not undermine the very existence of context the relevance of context in the picture because many a time uh, the consequences could be could be biased or the consequences would be negative because of a biased intervention of a mediator sometimes the consequences would be positive because again there is some favoritism that is playing on or sometimes there could be consequences that uh, may not render into learning the consequences that may not reflect into learning so all these aspects you can always relate it with the examples in the organizational scenario let's say you are an individual who sees that uh, there is an individual who is the favorite of your boss and many a time you see that even if he or she does something wrong the reaction elicited by the particular uh, boss would be quite milder when it when compared to the reactions that otherwise others get so this this should be this should not lead you to uh, understand or learn that my boss is going to reciprocate in a similar way because you have to understand the relevance of context the context is that he or she as the employer is one of the favorite of your boss and the boss is responding in the manner because of that context so if you ignore that context and you tend to try to con you know shape your behavior according to the consequences you are going to end up in big trouble so that would be context dependent and finally operant conditioning we cannot discard the role of skinner here because when it comes to reinforcement when it comes to punishment the role of skinner is vital he has established categorically that behavior to a certain extent can be modified by aspects or elements like reinforcement and punishment so let's come back to the big discussion that was pending which is positive reinforcement negative reinforcement punishment and extinction now let's look into positive and negative reinforcers positive reinforcers are specifically those behaviors or those reinforcers that strengthens and increases behavior by the presentation of a desirable consequence now this is interesting when you are looking into positive reinforcement essentially you want a desirable consequence that is the, the big difference when it comes to negative reinforcement negative reinforcement again please understand strengthens because when it comes to reinforcement one word that is critical is strengthen both the positive reinforcement as well as the negative reinforcement is vital in strengthening the behavior so it 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 like the positive reinforcement even the negative reinforcement strengthens and increases the behavior by the threat of use of an undesirable consequence or the termination of withdrawal of an undesirable consequence now this is interesting positive reinforcement negative reinforcement does not differ in terms of the strengthening part of the behavior in both the cases the behavior is strengthened and it increases the behavior whereas when you look into the other aspects how it is actually being carried out there is a presentation of the desirable consequence when it comes to positive reinforcement whereas when it comes to a negative reinforcement there is this threat of use of the undesirable consequence or the termination or withdrawal of an undesirable consequence we'll understand this with an example but before that we'll also look into some aspects of negative reinforcement it is more complex than positive reinforcement even with the definition you must have understood but more than that 
it is very difficult to actually strengthen the behavior when it comes to negative reinforcement. Positive reinforcement, there is a clear correlation. You give something which is a desirable consequence, people tend to jump into that. There is no doubt about it. Whereas, when you bring some negative consequence or negative reinforcement, it is not an easy task to actually reciprocate or bring that behavior out. So negative reinforcement undoubtedly is more complex and positive reinforcement, but it should not be equated with punishment. This is a big mistake most of the students make when they come to positive and negative reinforcement. Negative reinforcement is not punishment. We'll explain that. Negative reinforcement strengthens and increases behavior, whereas punishment weakens and decreases behavior. Please think about this. Please ponder on this point. When you are punishing somebody, you are actually making a statement that you are not supposed to undertake that activity. You are not supposed to do that work or you are not supposed to behave in that way. That is essentially punishment. But when you come to negative reinforcement, it is essentially an, a, a calling that you, are, you have to do that behavior. But there, if you are not doing it, there is an unintended or there is a negative consequence that is happening. Let's, let's look into this deeper with an example. What is positive reinforcement? Any appraisal in a positive way, any recognition, reward, award, you know, employee of the month or maybe the performer of the year or the best performer within the team or the best learner within the team, any sort of recognition uh, that can come in terms of monetary or otherwise, they all form under the category of positive reinforcement. They all come under the basket of positive reinforcement. What is negative reinforcement? Negative reinforcement, let's look into uh, something like uh, a day-to-day -day scenario. Uh, you are trying to give way for somebody who is, you know, trying to overtake you to prevent the honking. Or there might be some, you are going to have a spicy food. So as a precaution, you are taking an antacid or maybe another example, you are going, uh, let's say, uh, to play in beach, you are putting some sunscreen or some cream which is with high SPF. So all these are basically negative reinforcement, examples of negative reinforcement. You are trying to make that behavior, but that either that unintended, that, that negative consequence is being reminded of or the, the, the very fact that it will be taken back. So this is negative reinforcement. It strengthens and increases the behavior by the threat or use of an undesirable consequence or the termination or withdrawal of an undesirable consequence. So this is negative reinforcement. When you come to punishment, it does not strengthen the behavior. Punishment is specifically given to curb, to curtail the particular behavior. Let's look into the use of punishment. Punishment is one of the most used but the least understood and badly and administered aspects of behavior management. Let's uh, hear from any, any kids in our family. They will definitely vouch for this particular statement that uh, nobody knows how to actually administer punishment. Punishment is commonly thought to be the reverse of replacement but equally effective in altering behavior. Now, when you are actually looking into punishment from a negative side, it is generally, you know, uh, not considered as desirable, but punishment has its own benefit when it comes to behavioral training, behavioral change. Punishment usually consists of the application of an undesirable or let's say a noxious consequence, but it can also be defined as the withdrawal of a desirable consequence. So if you look into the previous aspect, we had looked into negative reinforcement as the termination or withdrawal of an undesirable consequence. Please don't make a mistake. This negative reinforcement happens to be the threat of the use of undesirable consequence, moreover, it is the termination or withdrawal of an undesirable consequence. But when you come to punishment specifically, punishment consists of application 
of an undesirable or noxious consequence. So this is something which is very important and differentiates punishment from the negative reinforcement. So it can also be defined as the withdrawal of a desirable consequence which is uh, diametrically opposite to that of a negative reinforcement. So taking away certain organizational privilege from a manager who has a poor performance record could be thought of or understood as punishment. So that is an example which we can always relate to as part of the punishment. Now let us look into the contrasting styles which we see from the textbook. Henry Adams has been a production supervisor for 8 years. He came up through the ranks and is known as a tough but hard working supervisor. Jane Wake has been a production supervisor for about the same length of time and also came up through the ranks. Jane is known as nice hard working boss. Over the past several years, these two superiors sections have been head and shoulders above the other six sections on hard measures of performance. When you are looking at hard measures of performance, we are basically looking at number of units produced. This is true despite the almost opposite approaches the two have taken in handling their workers. Henry explained his approach as follows. The only way to handle workers is to come down hard on them. Whenever they make a mistake, in fact, I call them together every once in a while and give them a heck whether they deserve it or not, just to keep them on their toes. If they are doing a good job, I tell them that's what they get paid off. By taking this approach, all I have to do is walk through my area and people start working like mad. Jane explained her approach as follows. You can see a st striking you know, difference here when it comes to her approach. I don't believe in that human relations stuff of being nice to workers, but I do believe that a worker deserves some recognition and attention from me if he or she does a good job. If people make a mistake, I don't jump on them. I feel that we are all entitled to make some errors. On the other hand, I always do point out what the mistake was and what they should have done. And as soon as they do it right, I let them know it. Obviously, I don't have time to give attention to everyone doing things right, but deliberately try to get around to people doing a good job every once in a while. Although Henry's section is still right at the top, along with Jane's section in units produced, personnel records show that there has been three times more turnover in Henry's section. So you can obviously see who is at a better performance than in Jane's section. So we are looking into the turnover and the quality control records show that Henry's section has met quality standards only twice in the last six years while Jane has missed attaining the standards only once. Now this is Jane having missed, not attained, please remember, missed attaining quality standards only once in last six years. So you have a clear winner there, don't you? So this is what the importance of learning is all about. So in this particular lecture, we looked into the theories in a more deeper fashion. We had a clear understanding of where we stood in terms of uh, the conditioning, classical operant. We had a clear understanding of what came in as a stimulus response theory. But we cannot undermine the existence of human element. We cannot understand, uh, undermine the existence of the cognitive element. So this is where we are thankful to Albert Bandura in bringing the social learning aspect. Social cognitive aspect took it one step ahead. So all these aspects are vital when it comes to organizational learning. When it comes to learning of an individual within an organization. So all these elements have one thing in common that is reinforcement as well as punishment. You cannot take that thing outside. You cannot take that outside the organization. You see that every single organization, there is a use of reinforcement every day, every now and then. There is some or the other form of reinforcement that is given to the employee. And also there is some or the other form of punishment that is given to the employee. You just need to observe 
you just need to understand in your organization what is driving your organization is it the culture of reinforcement that is driving your organization or is it the culture of punishment that is driving your organization on that note we'll end today's lecture see you in the next class till then take care bye bye <music>